Good to be back in Melbourne for the Australian Grand Prix. Bit of a scrappy Friday, partly because, well, this is a street circuit, park circuit if you like, so obviously it's going to pick up grip as the weekend progresses and there isn't a lot of grip on a Friday. Secondly, it was pretty gusty out there. Blue skies, beautiful day, packed grandstands, but nonetheless gusty. And thirdly, it's, well, it's these big, heavy, large, unwieldy Grand Prix cars of this current technical era. We've got one more year to run of them. Uh, and, and we've seen it many times. You load up the rear at medium to high speed, and there's a, if, you, if rear's going to go, it's going to be very sudden. It's the amount of weight involved at the back there. It's, it's an almost a pendulum-like thing, and, and we saw that a lot today. Alex Albon had a big shunt, medium to high speed. Valtteri Bottas had a huge spin. Uh, Max Verstappen damaged a floor. Both, both Mercedes drivers had scares at high speed. And so it went on. There was a lot out there. And, and that's why I say it was a bit scrappy. Because of the Alex Albon thing, the red came out and that took a lot of time out of FP1. And the really odd thing there, sad thing there really, is that because Williams didn't have a spare chassis, unlike say Ferrari in, in Vegas when the underside of Carlos's car was destroyed by that manhole cover coming loose. By the way, no recompense for Ferrari because of that. I was talking to Carlos about that. Nothing at all. No money, nothing. Incredible, isn't it? Anyway, because Williams didn't have a spare chassis, now Alex Albon is going to race the Logan Sargent car. And Logan Sargent, who's paying for that drive, is going to be watching the race from the sidelines. But I think that's it's a very odd decision. I suppose Williams have done it because they think, well, you know, Albon's the most likely point scorer and we've got to go for points. And they've said that Logan's been very gracious about it. But a really weird decision, I think. Bearing in mind, Logan also had a spin and managed not to hit anything. And yet Alex did in FP1. But there you go. Such a shame for Logan Sargent. Max didn't get out till after 20 minutes going into FP2. Normally that's not an issue, but he was suddenly out of sync with everybody else and didn't really get a great soft tyre run in as a result and didn't do a particularly long run on the medium tyre either. Speaking of tyres, Pirelli have a super, super soft red soft tyre here. And unusually, it hasn't done much running prior to this first appearance in Formula One. It's done a bit of testing. Lewis Hamilton did the longest run in the Bahrain test, pre-season test, but it wasn't a, uh, sorry, over the winter test. Uh, but it hasn't got a lot of history. And in the past, I suppose in the days of tyre war, when you had a Bridgestone and the Michelin or whatever, you would say, well, why would they bring a tyre that was so untested? In fact, they did say that. But, uh, but today, they kind of like that, the powers that be. I'm talking about they, the powers that be, because it's almost like flipping a coin. You don't really know how this tyre is going to react. Is it going to have high dig? Is it possibly going to have high wear rate? Is it going to be running really hot? Whatever. But if you take into account that this race historically has quite a lot of safety car interventions and that potentially the weather is very changeable, has been in the past, can be quite cold. It was quite a good call by Pirelli, I think, to bring in this soft tyre. And they make no bones about it. It will have quite high dig. And therefore, potentially, the race may not be just a standardised one-stop strategy race that we've seen in the past. Depends, of course, on a lot of other factors, safety cars particularly. But, uh, but we have this tyre. And I think that's also one of the reasons it was a bit scrappy, because uh, on that soft tyre, it, it seemed that you could do two sectors but not three really quickly. And that was something else, of course, that would be a factor in terms of the car losing grip. So all of that added up to Ferrari looking really impressive. And, and McLaren too. I shouldn't uh, mention Ferrari without McLaren because they had a very good day as well, as they have done in the past in FP1s, actually in FP2s on Fridays. But Ferrari looked really strong, particularly with Charles Leclerc. Carlos back in the, in the seat again after the appendicitis drama in Saudi Arabia. Saw him down in a coffee shop for breakfast. Looked very, um, very fit and ready to go. But a slightly different Carlos now that he knows he's not driving for Ferrari anymore at the end of this year. You can sort of feel that sense that when you talk to him. And it's kind of sad in a way, I think, because he has been driving very well over the last 18 months. Well, extremely well. He's progressed a lot. I don't want to sound in any way condescending. But Charles Leclerc, really good in the car today. He hasn't had particularly good runs in practice so far, on time practice, but he looked really good today on both light fuel when he was quickest and on the heavy fuel runs too. He looked very, very strong. The big, still a big talking point in the pit lane is what happened to his car in Bahrain and with the brakes. And I was asking quite a lot about that. And everywhere you go, it's, well, we can't possibly comment. Even companies that have nothing to do with Ferrari or the brakes on the Ferrari. So oh, can't possibly comment. But doing a little bit of investigative work, it, 
it turns out that some of the other Brembo, I say Brembo, Brembo, which I mean Brembo disc and Brembo caliper, because you don't necessarily have to run a Brembo caliper with a Brembo disc, and not all teams do. You can run an AP caliper, for example. Um, but the Brembo, Brembo runners, which is what Ferrari have, have had similar problems. It isn't just, that isn't the first time that sort of thing has happened. There was a temperature imbalance left to right, but also weird retardation on some laps but not others and then it would come back again just when you think it's you've got through that cycle there was talk about you know has maybe m mysteriously were the brakes glazed and i just find it so hard to believe that a guy like leclerc even if he lost all the sensors on the formation lap still wouldn't be able to get the brakes more or less up to temperature and would glaze them so i don't think it's that so interestingly there were quite a lot of changes made to brake discs walking up and down the pit lane between the two sessions and I surmise that amongst the Brembo runners, they're trying different brakes from different batches to see whether it's something to do with the manufacturing thing. Not, a, not an issue other than that this always happens in Formula One. Different manufacturing processes uh, at different times can have different results. So there's a lot of back-to-backing of brakes uh, particularly, and we don't often see that. And I think some people, Bob Constantinus always goes on, oh, Windsor's always going about brakes. But I think it's always quite an interesting thing. And certainly an interesting thing when it becomes a problem, as it did for Charles Leclerc in Bahrain. And so the long and short of that is that I don't think anybody, including Ferrari, yet know what the real problem was there. I don't think it was debris in the brake ducts, which is what I thought it might have been. But so many people do have debris in the brake ducts. It seems odd that they couldn't have got around that and they wouldn't have talked about it anyway so that was an interesting thing going on it, I'm not saying it will happen again but it's interesting that it's still something they're working on the other thing is Lewis Hamilton's seat thing in Bahrain which was apparently nothing broke the seat as I said it was, it's these things on which it's mounting these studs on which it's mounted the, it sort of slipped out apparently and then just magically slipped back into the slot again Seems a bit odd, but it was all sort of man of matter of fact in the way the explanation was given. So that's what that happened. I'm not sure Lewis was particularly impressed by that. So anyway, let's have a look at what Charles did with heavy fuel. 23-0, 22-8, 23-0, slow lap. He went off actually that 27-7, he, he left the road. And then 22-7, 22-7, really impressive. Color science, similarly impressive, but only one lap in the 22s, the rest in the low 23s or mid 23s. But look at the McLarens, Oscar Piastri, 22-8, 22-3, 22-4, 22-8, 22-6, 22-7. good run. Lando Norris also doing a 22-8, 22-9 at the end of his run. So Oscar Piastri looking really good. The only driver who came in right at the end and did the two or three laps on the soft tyre uh, as well, doing a 21-4. So it's not really relevant. And, you, and obviously he'd used up a bit of fuel by then. So compare that, those 22-7s with... Max on this occasion not getting into the 22s, his quickest lap at 23. Sergio Perez, yeah, he did a 22.7, but then the tyres seemed to deg after that at 23.2, 24.2, 23.2, 24.1. So it looked as if Red Bull not managing the tyres at the moment on the Friday. Fernando Alonso looked very good in the Aston Martin, as did Lance Stroll. Indeed, Lance Stroll slightly quicker than Fernando on the soft tyre 17.8 compared with Fernando 17.9. They were fourth and fifth behind Leclerc, Verstappen and Sainz in, with the soft tyre runs. So Fernando, does he do a 22? He doesn't do any 22s. The quickest lap is a 23-3. Uh, so, yep, there's a big gap there between Ferrari and Aston Martin with fuel. Let's look at Lance Stroll, 22-8. He did when the tyres are relatively fresh, but then again, a bit of deg there going on, 23-1, 23-7, 24-4 and so on so Aston Martin not too bad Lewis Hamilton didn't really do a proper run at all and ended by saying what times are they he did one lap and it wasn't very good it was a 24 and then he said what time's everybody else doing and they told him and he said oh well there's something wrong and that was it uh, George Russell 23.8 yeah 23.3 is the quickest he went compare that with what the McLarens are doing so just on the top speeds let's have a look at how these evolved between FP1 through the speed trap to FP2 and what work they may or may not have done in the pit lane, how they may have changed things. FP1, Red Bull, as ever, super quick. Sergio Perez, Max Verstappen, 3-2-3, 3-2-1. As ever, the Haas Ferraris right up there, Nico Hülkenberg. But Aston Martin, quicker than they've been of late. So 
we've got to assume at that point they may have taken a little bit of downforce out of the car relative to other teams for Albert Park. And look at Oscar Piastri, not too bad either. McLaren quite quick in a straight line in FP1. Lando Norris not too far, both doing 319. Let's look further down. George Russell 319, yeah, kind of territory. Lewis 318. But look at the Ferraris. 317 Science, 316. Charles Leclerc. The interesting thing would be whether or not Ferrari changed that going into FP2 and and gave themselves some top speed that they may need for the race, of course, because it's one thing to be super quick on a lap. It's another thing to have a great race car that is good in a straight line. So let's have a look. The Haas Ferrari is still there, both 1-2 in the, through the speed trap in the afternoon session, Kevin and uh, Nico Hülkenberg. And all of a sudden, Red Bull, for the first time this year, not at the top of the speed traps, 3-2-2 for both drivers. Looks looks as if Red Bull added some wing uh, between FP1 and FP2. Esteban Ocon surprisingly quick in the Alpine as well. That's quite encouraging. So did Ferrari take a bit of wing out of the car? Well, maybe they did on Carlos Sainz, but look at Charles Leclerc. Quickest on light fuel. Very, very good. Can't say he was actually quickest with heavy fuel, but right up there looking great on heavy fuel. And slowest through the speed trap. So as a result of that, it'd be really interesting to see how other teams react going into FP3 tomorrow. The problem is, of course, that the track will evolve, so that has to be brought into account as well. But if there's more grip, in theory, they should be, everybody should be able to take some wing out of the car. So it'll be interesting to see how the speed trap speeds compare tomorrow with what we've seen today. Just going down through the list of other times today, the, the two Aston Martins were fourth and fifth with light fuel. I'm talking about the light fuel times now. Uh, to Aston Martins, uh, George Russell six real white knuckle lap again from George. Just get this get this lap time out of the car, but it was very very on the edge, and Lewis wasn't going to go there. This was a, not an area in which Lewis Hamilton was going to tread very comfortably, and he didn't. Why would he on a Friday? Oscar in, on light fuel slightly quicker than Lando. Sergio Perez eighteen zero disappointing. You'd have to say. Uh, Yoki Sonoda, top 10, looking good again, slightly quicker than Daniel. Again, 18-1, Daniel 18-5. Guan Yuzhou, good job, 18-2 in the stake, the the uh, the Sauber. And Logan Sargent, P13, Valtteri Bottas, not too bad either. Quite a lot of upgrades on, that, uh, on the Sauber, and we didn't see them in terms of lap time but both drivers talking about potentially certainly q2 maybe q3 they're looking at so yeah okay we'll wait and see what happens tomorrow the other bit of news was that there was a lot of talk here about how in 2025 melbourne the australian grand prix will be the opening round of the championship because of all the, the date clashes with ramadan in uh, in the middle east it could well be back to melbourne for the first round of the championship that'll be fun won't it Anyway, looking ahead to tomorrow, Red Bull for sure will be back. McLaren, Mercedes looking strong and potentially a great day for Charles Leclerc and Ferrari. Let's see if he can continue with that momentum into qualifying and thus the race. He looks really strong with the car in both forms, light fuel and heavy fuel. Max had a scrappy day. Let's see what happens tomorrow. See you then. Take a pick and